the first thing that really defines nanotechnology is its very small size. On the top of this scale, we have an ant that is about five millimeters. To me, an ant is something really, really small. But we have to go down a million times to reach the nanometer scale. Because one nanometer is 10 to the power of minus nine meters. Our DNA, about two nanometers wide. The visible light has a wavelength of about 400 to 700 nanometers. If we look on the technology side, on the top here, you find the head of a pin, one to two millimeters. Then we go down to the nanometer scale and we find structures like this, the carbon nanotube. I think you might have heard about graphene due to the Nobel Prize, like one layer of carbon atoms. And if you sort of fold that, you form this carbon nanotube. And that's a common structure in nanotechnology. And then we also have atoms that are ordered, but this time the order is made by man, not by the material itself. Uh, today, uh, nanotechnology is used a lot towards making materials uh, stronger and lighter. Uh, but the research, a lot of research is done towards uh, available and cheap energy, uh, faster computers, uh, long-lasting mobile phone batteries, uh, cheap cleaning of water, uh, detection of diseases, uh, implants, not least in the brain. One could say that basically we envision that with the help of nanotechnology in the future, we could be able to save the uh, environment, solve the energy crisis, eradicate diseases, and uh, well, who knows, in the end, maybe get eternal life. Uh, 2009, the global nanotechnology industry was worth uh, 215 billion dollars. And the prognosis for uh, 2020 is three thousand billion dollars. 1991, this Japanese gentleman figured out that if you take two rods of graphite and you put a high voltage in between them, then actually the molecule structure of graphite changes and turns into this, which is a carbon nanotube. We build up our structures, atom layer by atom layer, to form what we want. We already have a lot of products on the market with nanotechnology in them. The common definition of nanotechnology is that you need to have at least one dimension that's smaller than 100 nanometers. A lot of parts in our electronics are on the nanometer scale today. And what you see here in these two images is surface modifications. So here you see a building where the walls and the glass have been treated, so you have put a specific surface on them that makes them self-cleaning. Well, actually, uh, nanoparticles are not that new. Uh, we have airborne nanoparticles around us all the time. Uh, nature produces huge amounts of uh, nanoparticles. For example, when uh, vegetation releases volatile organic compounds that uh, reacts with ground level ozone. And of course, since the industrialization, humankind has been really good at involuntarily create nanoparticles too. And if you thought that candles was a potent nanoparticle generator, just look at the combustion engine. We have been inspired by nature in some of the nanotechnology um, applications. We can also look in nature and see this beautiful bird or this fly. And if you see this blue metallic color, you might think, oh, it's a true color. But it's actually structures on the feathers and on the back of this fly on the same scale, so 100 nanometer scale, so that the incoming light is interacting with these structures and only this blue metallic light is reflected. So it is not a color, it's a nanostructure. So this is a gecko, you know, the small animal that can walk on walls and walk in the roof. And people were puzzled for many years, how is this possible? How can the gecko carry its own weight? And they thought maybe it has some sucking device under their feet or something. And when you invented good enough microscopes, you started looking at the gecko feet and you saw very many small hairs and on each hair, you had even more hairs. So actually, it's not complicated why the gecko can walk and carry its own weight. It's just due to very weak van der Waal forces. 
these are forces acting between anything. So if I hold my finger to my hand, I have these van der Waals forces acting, but I have so few contact points, so I don't really feel the forces. But if you have billions of these contact points, then these forces are added up, and they get strong enough to carry the weight of the, this little gecko. And researchers have been inspired by this and developed so-called gecko tape. So you don't need any glue. And the latest thing they want to use this for is to move around parts in outer space, parts that are not magnetic. Another example of uh, nano in nature is the lotus leaf and the lotus effect. So you have maybe seen these leaves. They are um, said to be self-cleaning because water doesn't wet the surface. It just keeps like this nice droplet. So if you have dirt on this leaf, the droplet will pick it up and take it away. And that is because of small structures. You have small microstructures and then even smaller uh, nanostructures. And due to this structure, this water droplet cannot wet the surface. It will stay as a droplet. So this surface is called to be super hydrophobic. This is one example where you use the property of nano that it's just very, very small. Another important thing to remember about nanotechnology is that material and electrons behave differently on this scale. Another example of changing properties is, for example, color. So you have all seen a gold coin. It looks this gold yellowish color. And if I break it in two, each piece will still be this gold yellowish color. But if I do that enough times and reach the nanometer scale, the gold will appear to look red. And if I make it small enough, it's actually transparent. The quantum dots or the really small <coughs> nanoparticles. So here we see cadmium selenide, that's material. And just by changing the diameter and the, or the size of these particles between two and six nanometers, you can make all of these different colors. And in these materials, each color is very, very defined. It's very sharp. And that's what they use in this so-called quantum dot TV. It's really awesome. I give you that, definitely. But do you know that when you take all the research money that goes into nanotechnology, 90% of it goes to developing these new cool things. And merely 10% goes towards safety research concerning all these new particles. Particles, nanoparticles or other particles can enter our body in mainly three ways. Either through the skin or through the mouth into the gastrointestinal tract or through inhalation. You can uh, control what you eat, right? But you can never choose not to breathe. So we are pretty convinced that when it comes to nanoparticles, inhalation would be the most ex important exposure route. When we talk about nanoparticles, 10, 20 nanometers, actually 90% of them would get stuck in the lung. It is not only due to what particle concentration you inhale. It has to do with the particle properties, but we don't really know which. So the products we want to have are typically in the millimeter or meter range, and we are good at making materials on the atomic scale. That is a quite big uh, gap, seven to nine orders of magnitude to bridge to actually get these really nice material into products that we can use. And I think this is where it's really important for us researchers to collaborate with companies because you know how to make stuff on a large scale. And hopefully, Nano can help you with, I think coatings is the most, that's the easiest example I think of when I think about your heat exchangers and what you want to use it for. So I hope we have showed you that nanotechnology, you can provide sensing technologies in coatings, you can have increased heat transfer, you can have hydrophobic properties, uh, self-cleaning properties, and there are probably many more. I'm not sure we can offer eternal life. Not but right I now. <laughs> Not right Still. now. <laughs> but I am sure that you can improve the environment and you can help solving the energy crisis and help eradicate diseases. Engineered nanoparticles today are moving really fast from research and de development to large-scale industrial production, which is good, right? So we can take advantage of all that the nanotechnology can offer us. But it also becomes increasingly critical that we understand that toxicity or the toxicological properties of these particles, both for um, 
consumer products, for work environment and for ecosystems. Yes, and that's why it's really important already when we design this material to be aware of this so we don't expose ourselves or our environment to potential risks. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you so much.